This morning, um, I was preparing yesterday and kind of thinking about what, what I needed to share. And uh, the last two or three times, I remember coming up and, and teaching on uh, double dreams. Uh, this time, it's not a double, but I think there are some things that, um, that I feel like are very applicable to where we are and where we're going and the partnership that God's extending to all of us. In, in this next season that we're going to be walking in. And, and I know just looking at the title and the subtitle here, it really is um, a spectacular type of title. It's not just a title. It's something I feel that we are going to be uh, partnering with him in these ways in the years to come, where we are actually going to be parting seas and healing waters. And I know that that sounds really odd, doesn't it? I mean, but it's really something that is biblical. Um, and and, and the, it could be a literal thing where we, like Moses, and we're going to look at Moses and, and the story of the Red Sea, where God used him to perform some of the most incredible miracles known to man. Um and even done by a man, or, and I want to say done by, you guys know what we're saying, we're, it's a partnership. God's always looking for someone where he can speak what he's going to do, and ask that person to believe what he's saying, and then walk that out with him in faith. And Moses did that, and the people, they, I mean, they made mistakes along the way, they murmured, they complained, they, they're just like us, we do the same thing, <laughs> um, but it's really an astounding thing to go, you know, well, how, why would we even need to part the sea? Well, there might be an army behind us. We can't see them yet, but we might be in a situation that calls for us to be led by God to... Now, this is interesting, too. God led them in the wilderness uh, towards the Red Sea. It wasn't like this was something that they... Somehow they had missed the mark or they had... They had messed up. That was not it at all. The scripture says Elohim, the heart of God, led them into the wilderness towards the Red Sea. Why would God do something like that? It almost sounds like he's setting up people for failure, right? But again, he sees the end from the beginning. He already knew that Moses and the people were going to cross through on dry land. He knows all the steps that lead up to the parting of the sea. But he still requires us to go, you know what? I don't see the dry ground. I don't think it can happen. But I'm going to believe God no matter what it looks like in the natural. Because if he said this, then he's going to perform it. And that's the thing. We don't have to do that. That's his job. Our job is to hear him and follow through in obedience and partnership. And as we do that, he does the rest. So if he says he's looking for an intercessor, and we know he is, then we intercede, right? And we let his spirit do the impossible things through us. And with that in mind, we're going to look at a couple of chapters here in, in Exodus chapter 14 and 15. of, And we all know this story, but it's not just a story. This is going to be, become a reality in ways that we can't see just yet. And it might be where we are led to a situation that looks insurmountable, that looks totally impassable. Kind of like the coronavirus and kind of like the other strands that are popping up, right? Where the enemy's trying to do this now and finagle his way. And he's always trying to change the times and the seasons, right? Which is a, a biblical thing. I mean... Um, but we need to, no matter what we face, no matter what we see in the natural, we cannot let that dictate our course. We cannot. If we do, we're, we're, we're going to be totally discouraged and let down. But let us be like David, or where we encourage ourselves in the plan of God. We do that. You know, it's, it's, it's one thing for somebody else to come alongside and encourage you. But it's totally another thing for us to do that for ourselves. Because so much of this isolation that we've been in for so many months, God's in all of it. Whether we 
cognitively can put it all together and analyze it and go, here's why, here's why. It, do, it doesn't really matter. We know that the steps of a righteous man or a woman are what? Ordered by the Lord. Do you think Corona has God fumbling around going, man, what are we going to do? He's not, he, he has not, there is not one bit of anxiety in the heart of God when it comes to anything, much less a coronavirus. So he's, he's well aware of what's going on, and he just wants us to continue to be, be an obedient people and partner with him no matter what's going on in this world around us. And so we are partnering in, in ways that are, that are peculiar, that are unique. But in the coming days where he's leading us and the places we're all going to be going, it will require the parting of seas. It will require turning something that's very bitter into something that's sweet. And, and that's what, and the way that God did it was so unusual. It says, and we'll see this in a minute, it says, when they got to that point, this is at the very end, they come to this place of bitterness, and they, they're going to drink the water, but they can't because it's too bitter, and, and God shows Moses a what? A tree. <laughs> and the tree's cast into the water, and it turns it from bitterness to sweetness, right? That's so ridiculous. What was in the tree, I mean, it's just, it just shows you the ways that God moves is totally different than the way we think. We would think, oh, we need, to, we need to not drink any of the water. We just need to get away from here. Maybe there's, a, there's another source of water over here. Let's go drink here. No. God turned the bitterness into sweetness in the form of a tree. Yeah. So let's look, beginning, and we're just going to kind of go down the line here, verse by verse. In chapter 14 and 15. So it says here in verse 1, and this is where Yahweh is instructing the leader. Very important. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Keep your mouth closed, right? Don't say anything. Be silent. Well, that's one method God uses, but in this case, He said, I need you to use the declarative capacity that I've given you on the earth. I speak unto the children of Israel that they turn. And encamp before, uh, this is a hard word to pronounce here, Pahatharoth, I think that's, that's close enough, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal, Baal Zephon, before it shall you encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, listen to what the enemy's saying here. They are entangled in the land. Entangled there means they're just getting so involved with what's going on in the land. To, to, to involve yourself with something in a way that's not good. And then he says, the wilderness will shut them in. Now, if you, if you look up shut them in, it literally means to, to, sh to shut them up to the point where they surrender. That's what the enemy's saying through Pharaoh here. Don't you know the enemy wants us all to feel that way now? Don't you think he wants you to go, well, the corona, oh, my God, people are going, still going nuts. Even though a vaccine has here has been released, and I know the vaccines had some side effects. I mean, good grief! It, it's gonna have that. It's brand new, but people are pointing to that as like trying to discredit anything that the leader had done. And I'm like, are are you guys just crazy? What is wrong with you? This is helping a lot of people. So we, he's he's wanting us to just give up the enemy. And surrender and say, you know, it's really not worth all of this. You know, this corona thing has killed so many people. Yes, but how many people have recovered? That's one of the things about the media. Just, just I have such a distasteful, just, it just irritates me to no end as they paint this negative picture. I don't watch the news that much. And growing up, that's the way it was when I, when I was a young boy. And I'm grateful to my parents for that. I stay, I want to know just enough to know what's going on, but I do not want to spend hours and hours in front of the TV watching the news like so many people do because it's so negative. Because whatever comes in through the eyes and through the ears, guess what? It can get inside you. And you can start to battle with things that God never intended you to battle with in your thoughts about it. So how many have recovered? You rarely hear that, right? 
It's always, oh, we got this number dying, this number dying. Well, every time I say that, I hear it when I'm walking through my house and news is on, I'm like, yeah, well, how many have recovered? Just to release that, you know, and we need to use our declarative capability from our seat in the heavens to declare things that God is saying, not what the enemy's saying, not what the media is saying. We need to release it and say it all the time. That's how we fight. That's one of our weapons of war is we use our declarative capability, right? We use the sword of the breath of God that's within us. Release that. And so the enemy is wanting us to just give up. I mean, he is just wanting us to surrender. And in this case, it was a wilderness type of a, of a, a situation. And, and, then this, and then the Lord tells Moses, um, now, now notice... Yahweh's communicating this to the leader. This is not Pharaoh saying this. Yahweh's letting Moses know, here's what's going on in the very um, hidden places within the thoughts and the mind of Pharaoh. I'm telling you what he's thinking. I'm telling you what the enemy wants to do. But he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored, Chabad, upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am Yahweh. And they did so. That's very interesting. Isn't it? This is Yahweh communicating major, major revelatory words to the leader. It's impressive. I'm, that's, that's Yahweh's job. It's not my job to go after anything like trying to get a word. You know what I'm saying? It, we don't have to do that. We need to position ourselves in, in prayer and intercession. As we do that, then Yahweh, will, he will make sure we get exactly what he's reserved for all of us. I mean, we've known that for years, but I mean, we really see this coming alive in, in some really powerful ways. Great, great enemy strategies revealed through this, this time of, of commune between Yahweh and Moses. And in verse 5 it says, And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. Now the king is getting some information, right? And the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And now they openly are declaring, Why have we done this, that we let Israel go from serving us? So now the plan of the enemy has backfired, right? It's failing. <laughs> And he's realizing it, so now he thinks he needs to do something. So he starts to mobilize in a different manner now, and he does this. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and the captains over every one of them. And Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued after the children of Israel... And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. Not just a hand, but a high hand. High hand and a high hat, right? Is that three aces? But, <laughs> but the Egyptians pursued after them. All the chariots and all the horses of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army. And they overtook them in camping by the sea beside Pehatharoth before Belzephon. That's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, you would think that the people of God, they have no way out. They're surrounded, right? This massive army, these horsemen, the captains, they're just, they ought to just lay down and give up, right? Now, one would think that, but, you know, remember, the heart of God, Elohim, if you read a couple of chapters before, it's either Exodus 12 or 13, it says, Elohim led them this way. And he did it. For, with specific purpose in mind, so they would continue to learn how to fight, right? I mean, he does, he's got his reasons. Sometimes we don't really get it initially, and that's okay. But as, as the plan starts to unfold, we see more, right? And, we, and we, we gain this understanding that we didn't have two months ago, six months ago, a year ago. Where are we going to be next year this time, December of 2021? You think we're going to be dealing with corona still? Well, if you listen to the media, yeah, it's not going away until 2022. That's what I heard last night. It doesn't matter. 
God's not dead. He's still alive and he's still moving. He's still wanting to do things that are related to the plan. And, and this must have been part of the plan. Otherwise, he would have not allowed it to happen, right? Everything that, we, that happens is part of the eternal plan. It doesn't, we, don't, it, we don't have to make sense of it all. In fact, I can't make sense of it all. Neither can you. It doesn't make any sense, but yet we, we don't even need to waste our thought processes on trying to... Sometimes we waste, and I'm saying from a... Waste so much time trying to think about things where God's going, that's my job. Don't worry about that. <laughs> and he's probably just... He's kind of just in the partnership with us. He's kind of laughing under his breath going, don't focus on that. That's my job. I will harden. It's not my job to harden the, the heart of uh, a king, Right? That was Yahweh's job. But so many times it kind of gets skewed where we think we need to kind of help God out a little bit, right? Let's just make it happen. I remember somebody used to work with, that was one of their key phrases. Let's just make it happen. I'm like, almost sounds like we're forcing something, right? It does. So it's liberating when, when you find out what his job is and what our job is. But as humans, we tend to still kind of have issues with that and it's okay i mean he doesn't just say you know what <laughs> i've tried to tell you this for the 10th time even though that may be true he, he doesn't leave us he doesn't abandon us like we so quickly abandon people around us we are not anything like him he's perfect he doesn't just get furious with or angry and go you know what i've had the last time i'm going to do this thing for you i am so glad he doesn't just up and leave us because we continue to maybe uh, kind of get off the pathway sometimes. <laughs> we all do this. But now what happens? So they're surrounded. The enemy wants them to surrender. And then in verse 10, the people are, are beginning, they're in fear and they start complaining. Man, consider the circumstances. I think we've all been there, right? Maybe you hadn't been in the wilderness, but you've been in a tough spot where it's been rough and you felt distress, stress, whatever prefix you put in front of it. And we do the same thing. We shouldn't do it, but we, there's just that inner struggle with the, the old carnal nature that just seems to raise its ugly head up. And then there's us in the mix of that. <laughs> and then you've got the breath of God within us. So there's that constant war going on that Paul spoke of. And so it says, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel, this is one of the first things that they started to do. They lifted up their eyes, and they're looking at the Egyptians that are marching after them. They, they have their eyes on the enemies. There's nothing wrong with recognizing the enemies there, right? You know, the Scripture says he's preparing a table before us in the presence of our enemies, right? Right? But if you keep reading, and after they did that, there was this fear. They were sore afraid. So you got fear that comes in. So this next wave of what the enemy's trying to do is he's wanting us, he's recognized that we're, there's a surrounding influence, and he recognizes that that's not getting us off the path. He's coming around in a second swoop to try to get us to focus on enemies that are behind us or around us or whatever to try to get us off the path. We're not going to do that. Now, there are going to be some that will. There's going to be some that they're going to be panic-stricken. They're going to be wear the mask for the next 10 years. I mean, craziness is going to ensue. Gross darkness is taking on new meaning and new form in this new year. It doesn't mean we have to fear, and it doesn't mean we have to take our eyes off the focus of the Lord and His plan, that's where we need to focus in the midst of chaos, in the midst of gross darkness. Corona is just the beginning. And as much as I hate to say that, prophetically, Isaiah said the same thing many, many years ago. What does gross darkness really look like? Well, if we go and we start reading the book of Revelation, we find out there are some things that are going to be happening that are far gross than what we're facing now. 
but we don't have to fear, and we don't need to focus on the armies that are, that are, that are behind us. So you got fear that's come in. And the children of Israel, one of the things they did here was good, though. In the midst of that, they cry out for the eternal plan. They cry out for Yahweh. We need to do the same. Even though the enemy's behind us, look, okay, stay forward. Focus on the eternal plan. Cry, continue crying out for that to manifest. And then they said to Moses, this is kind of where they start to get off the, get off the wagon. Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Man, gee whiz, did you remember everything that happened prior to this? Had God not done anything <laughs> for you at this point? This is where, if we're not careful, we can allow the atmosphere and things that are around us to just absolutely cause us to plummet into despair and into depression and into fear and we just, we cannot go there. He says, where, they say, wherefore hast thou dealt this with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell you in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? They wanted to revert back. In, but it's in the midst of challenging circumstances where they've got a massive army ready to just take them all out, right? I mean, it's pretty rough, wouldn't you say? And I'm not being hard on the, on the children of Israel here. I'm not. I'm, I'm just saying, hey, let's look at this and go, man, I see myself in that. <laughs> Lord, I don't want to get to a point where I'm thinking like I'm dying in the wilderness. Why would you bring me here to this thing? Why would you let corona go on and on and on and on and on, you know, the way we can really get thinking. And, boy, when you start, once you start down that road, it's just like, Okay, I've already said 15 things that I shouldn't have said, right? So rather than go down that pathway, we just need to always focus on, yes, the enemy's surrounding us, the enemy's behind us. Fear might try to come in, but let's continue to cry out for the eternal plan. And then they say this. Not only did they say, hey, we should have just let us serve the Egyptians, but they said, for it had been better, or Tob, for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. So now they're associating Tob and saying it was better that we serve the Egyptians. And that's totally a twisted thought that they had. And, and they declared that. And we know that's, that's, not, that's not right. Now, Moses could have responded in a lot, of, a lot of ways, right? He could have said, you know what, I've had it with you guys. You're on your own. <laughs> I mean, he could have. Man, lots of people, <laughs> lots of leaders might have, might have went down that pathway. A lot, lot of leaders have done that in the past where they abandon their people just because things kind of get rough and tough, right? That's, that's tragic. This is all part of it. This is part of being a leader in the midst of people that are just going nuts. In the midst of a situation where you've got so many voices saying this and saying that, but really... The only voice that matters is the voice of God, right? What is he saying? Well, he led us. He's led us to this, right? The Elohim led the people in the wilderness. So if he's led us there, then whatever happens, he knows exactly what's going on. He knows all the details. And so Moses says this to the people. Now notice, it, it didn't say Moses went away and prayed for five days and sought the Lord. No. I mean, he came to the fore. The Lord had already started talking to him. He knew what was going on. He alerted the leader to specifics. And he said to the people, first thing he addressed was fear. He said, fear ye not. And so any type of... Now, common sense here, this is not the type of... If, if you're out in the woods, okay, for, and this did happen, I'm just going to share this. I had a stare down at a five, about five yards with a wild hog with no gun, no bow, nothing. The only thing I had was my, my nephew had a 38 pistol over here. And, and there's a hog staring me down like five yards in front of me. And I'm waiting on him to see if he's going to charge me, if he's going to run off. And we're just staring, staring down one another. And I forget why I'm going this, down this path. <laughs> Let me look at the verse here that, that triggered this. 
There was a reason. Fear. Oh, fear. Here we go. That would have been a point for me to, to fear, right? I wasn't afraid. I mean, I was just a stare down. And eventually, you know, most animals out there, they'll just run off. Unless, they're, unless they have rabies or unless you're, you come up on them with their, uh, their, their, their babies or whatever. Then they'll get kind of furious and protective. And that makes sense, right? So he addressed the fear. And then secondly, he said, stand still. And, and pastor, you know this passage very well. This is the one that was used when, when the, um, the front row was filled with, you know, a lot of our uh, other brothers. Um, that day, and I remember it, and I was, I was studying, I, I reflected back on that day. Stand still here means just a, a point of positioning where you are not going to be moved. I mean, there's nothing that's going to cause you to be, you know, uh, waver to the left or right. You are stationary, you're positioned, and you're not going to move. So that's, that's his second directive to the people of God. And his third one was, the third one required more of an um, um, action on the part of the people. He said, see the salvation of Yahweh. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. He said, fear not. Stay positioned where you're at. Don't leave. Don't run. Don't, don't go nutso on me. And then he said, Ra'ah, use the discerning capabilities that I've given you to see the good and the evil, and in the midst of it, see the delivering power that's going to come from the eternal plan. That is incredible. Three, three things that the leader said to the people. Powerful things, too, in the midst of what's going on. And I believe the Lord would say it's the same things to us in this time frame that we're in. Don't fear. There are fear-mongering voices all over the place. I mean, every time you turn on the news, they may not come out and use the word fear, but the, the content, the essence of, of what they're saying is fear-laden. We don't need to fear. I mean, look at this. We're going to see what God did in the midst of this situation. There was no human way out. Nothing the people could do on their own. But then we've got to that second part. No matter what is going on, no matter how hard the winds are blowing, we must stand still, remain in our position, in our placement, in our location, in our terio, and stand there. You know, you got the histeme coming in here too, but we, we just need to remain calm. We, why do we get so stressed out? I mean, why do we get so anxious? I mean, why do we worry? I mean, we're human, but what I'm saying is we've got the, we've got the creator of the universe that can do anything no matter what it looks like. He can handle all that. I mean, he, he can deal with all that. When we, start to, when we start to look at things in the natural and start to overanalyze, sometimes I do that, overanalyze a situation where you get it down to something that's just so minuscule and, um, man, it, wears, it can wear you out. I mean, it just, let things happen as they happen, you know. Let, don't, don't try to help. We don't need to help God out. I mean, who do we think we are trying to help him out anyway? I mean, when you really think about it, does he need our help? No, he can do it all on his own, but he chooses to partner with us. So he says, I want you to be able to see the delivering power that comes from my eternal plan, which he will show you this day. For the Egyptians whom you have seen Ra'ah today shall Ra'ah them again no more forever. Yahweh will fight for you, and you will hold your peace. So he, re he reiterated the fact, hold your peace, stand your ground, stay positioned, don't let fear overtake you, and he says, watch, what, watch the delivering power that's going to come from you partnering to my eternal plan. That's all that matters. That's it. <laughs> that's pretty cool. We've done this all throughout this journey. It's just that these, these stages in the ballgame, it's, it's, it's different. 
And then, so we keep reading, and so Yahweh continues to give further instructions to the leader in, in Exodus 14, 15 through 20. And Yahweh says unto Moses, Why are you crying unto me? So Moses, Moses, I mean, I, I believe his heart was right. I don't think he did anything wrong here. I think he was doing what he felt like he needed to do, crying out to Yahweh. Sounds like a good thing to me, right? But Yahweh says, speak to the children of Israel. Again, he's going back and saying, you declare what I've already told you to do. And he said, tell the people that they do what? Go forward. Keep moving forward. No matter what's behind. The enemy's behind you, right? He said, stand still. And now he's saying, okay, tell them to go forward now. And at that point, he said a, a second thing, though. But lift thou up thy rod. Second thing, and here's a third one. Stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And he said, when you do that, the children of Israel will go on dry land through the midst of the sea. Now, I have to be honest with you. That's pretty extraordinary, right? And I'm glad Yahweh's saying he's going to do this, but it still demanded absolute obedience, right? Moses could have said, man, I think some kind of demon's telling me to do this. This sounds so crazy. He could have did anything. And then in verse 17, it says, And behold, I'm going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they're going to follow them, and I will get me Kabod on Pharaoh and all his host, on all the chariot and all the horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I have gotten honor upon Pharaoh and upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. Now, here's, here's the angelic um, intervention here, too. And the angel of Elohim, which was before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went before them, went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came to the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of the, uh, Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that one came not near the other night. So God was protecting his people with the cloud and the fire, right? But to the enemy, what they couldn't see, it was a, it was a, um, they, it was a, what do you call it? It was an obstruction where they couldn't get beyond it. I think that's very interesting too. Don't you think? That's amazing. Yeah, that mean, they had to, they had to trust what Yahweh was communicating to the leader. Okay, we have to trust that he's communicating to the leader and giving instru instru detailed instructions along the way. Uh, so yeah, that's a great point. Circumstances hadn't changed, but he still required us moving forward. And so at this point, Moses has, it's on him now. Yahweh said, I'll do all these things. Here's what I need you to do in partnership. And in verse 21, it says, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh caused the sea to go back by a strong east ruach all that night. And he made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. See, Moses' job was to lift up the rod. Yahweh's job was to do all the rest. So there's that obedience and partnership. And if we can join the two like that, like we've been doing, but... The Lord's requiring much more of us, and he's asking us to really believe for things that aren't manifesting yet, but he says, go forward. If we can stand with him, we're going to watch him do some of the most remarkable miracles in the coming days. I really believe that. And it's interesting that he used his breath to divide and to dry up. I mean, that's what, what the wind there is. I looked at it, Ruach. <laughs> His breath can do anything. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. Now, see, there, there's some trust there, too. I mean, they, they could have turned and said, Moses, have you lost your mind? Are you crazy? I mean, they could have done that. It sounds crazy to the human mind, right? But it says they went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were walled into them on the right side and on the left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning, watch, Yahweh looked. Yahweh looked. And the word for look there is, 
It's not ra'ah. It's another Hebrew term. It means he's, he's leaning out. He's peeping in and looking and gazing and checking everything out. What is he looking at? The host of the Egyptians. And he's doing it through the pillar of fire and through the cloud. And as he does that, he recognizes he needs to do something. And it says, what did he do? He troubled the host of the Egyptians. In other words, he threw everything into commotion with what the enemy was trying to do. I believe we're coming into a time frame where the Lord is going to begin to throw everything that the enemy's trying to do into commotion he's going to disturb it and he's going to he's going to deal with it he's going to take care of it and it says and this is the kind of the humorous part and he took off their chariot wheels <laughs> so very interesting right you wouldn't think that that would be the way that god would bring well there's quite a few miracles that have happened and this was just part of it so he took off the chariot wheels that they drave them heavily so that the egyptians said let us flee from the face of Israel, for Yahweh fights for them against the Egyptians. <laughs> so here, he, he's taken off the wheels. He, he's used his breath to, to, to cause this wall on the left and the right for the people to walk through on dry ground. That is, that's for, there's no way humanly possible that this, this can be done. There's no, you got, you, you, there's no human element involved in this other than partnership. Other than being like Abraham and hearing what God wants to do and saying, Yes, Lord, I believe what you said at the right hand. And then God will use this to influence others here as we, as we keep reading. And then the Lord says to Moses, Okay, so Yahweh's done his job. Now it's time for Moses, the partner, to do his. Stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon the chariots, and upon the horsemen. This is a second time that God's asked Moses to lift up the rod. And okay, he, the first time, what happened? Whew, the wall of water. God did the miracle and let him walk through on dry ground. Now this time, God's going to partner with Moses and say, you know what? Now I'm, I'm going to use, I'm going to partner with you to destroy the enemy. Lift up the rod. And as he did that, over the sea... <coughs> the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and, and Yahweh overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so as much as one of them. Lifting up twice. I know pastor's done teaching on the hand part, and that's, that's there. But two, boy, this is, this is incredible. So he partnered with him to say, hey, lift up your hand. I'm going to let the people walk through. Lift up the, your hand with the rod. I'm going to cause the, the water to come back to its own strength. Those are the types of, of demonstrations that are coming as we go forward as a people in this next year and the years to come. Now, I don't know all the details. That's not, again, that's not for us to know. It's, I, I believe the Lord can do it. I know he can. And we could cite Miracle after miracle in our own lives to encourage ourselves in the Lord that he's going to do things like this. In the verse 29, But the children of Israel walked upon the dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall on the right and on the left. Thus, Yahweh saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore, what could that be a sight to behold? <laughs> now they're looking from a totally different perspective, right? Beforehand, they were focused on the enemy. Fear tried to take in. Now the victory's been won, and now they're looking at their enemies dead on the seashore. Those are the types of things that we can believe God for in the coming days to see the aftermath of what he's done to annihilate enemy forces. And I'm not saying killing people physically. I'm just saying... Dealing with the enemy, who's the source of a lot of the evils that are being released into our world and all around us. We're going to see manifestations of people recognizing and raaing the good purpose that comes out of all the evil that's here. And there are going to be many people that are going to experience the delivering power of Yahweh and His eternal plan as we move forward. There's a lot of things in here that are very applicable to our walk. 
So verse 31 says, And Israel wrought that great work which, the, which Yahweh did upon the Egyptians. And here's a result of what happens. Some of the results. The people, the people, the people feared the plan of Yahweh. That's what we want. That's what we want. And, and I know if, if you study, you know, if you study the, the walk of the, uh, the children of Israel from beginning to end, they start out well, they make some mistakes along the way, <laughs> and then they, they come back. So it's kind of like an ebb and flow, which really is a, kind of the way we as people do, right? So I'm not real prone to, you know, just make the children of Israel look like idiots or morons. Some people, whenever you hear messages, they'll make them feel like they're the scum of the earth. And it's like, really, there's a lot of the, the children of Israel in all of us. There's a lot of Saul's, Saul in us. You know, so they, when's the last time you were in front of a sea and an army was behind you or me? I've never had that happen quite like that. So I'm not going to be quick to judge them. Uh, our circumstances are different, but as we keep reading this, not only did the people fear the plan, but then they believed Amon, Yahweh, the eternal plan that was being revealed, and his servant Moses, and the leader that was directing him and getting words from Yahweh. That's incredible. Now, as a result of that, we got about 10 minutes left. Here's what happens. And this is, this is a pattern... For us, anytime we're, we're in obedience and we're partnering with, with, with the Lord in these ways, when we come out of it, he's going to fill our mouth with a song of triumph. Then saying Moses and the children of Israel this song unto Yahweh, and they spake saying, I will sing unto Yahweh. I will sing about the eternal plan, for he has triumphed. And triumphed there, I've put the definition for you. He has mounted up, he's risen up, and he's become majestic in a glorious fashion for us. And they were specifically, the content of the, of the song was the horse and the rider he's thrown into the sea. I remember hearing that song, you know, as a young boy, and the horse, and there's all different kinds of songs with a horse and the rider in it. This is something these people lived. And as we come into this point in this new year, we, we've done this in the past. I'm not saying it, but it's going to take on a different flavoring because what he has for all of us is different in this new year. And let there be songs of great triumph be birthed in us, and we can sing about those and, and share, you know, you know, we, we might have some kind of song about the coronavirus. Or I don't know. I'm just joking. But you get the point. It's, it's a point of deliverance. And, and so they join in, and they say, Yahweh is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. He is my Elohim, and I will prepare him a habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. This is something else that they talked about. By virtue of that experience, the Lord, Yahweh, is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Very descriptive, very detailed. And the only way somebody can sing a song of triumph like that is how they've walked through that experience with the Lord. We've had some incredible experiences and encounters and things of the Lord. And may we never forget those. May we never forget those. Some of us can't sing very well, you know, but thankfully we're singing about, well, it's unto Yahweh and it's about his eternal plan. So sing it anyway. If you can't carry a tune in a bucket, sing in the shower. I mean, it doesn't matter. The God's not in, you see how we're so interested with things? I mean, you, I'm, I'm preaching the choir here, but it, it's so funny. I get so tickled when I think about how we get, if it doesn't sound just right or we get off key, boy, we just start going kind of, God's really not concerned about that stuff. He, he knows the, the intent of the heart. I'm grateful for that, and I know you are too. So 
these, these days that we're in, they're, they're still challenging. I mean, but there's, there's great fruitfulness in all of this. And the people are singing about it. The depths, okay, I've already read that. The depths have covered them. They sank into the sea. Thy right hand, O Yahweh, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Yahweh, has dashed in pieces the enemy. So there's a connective there with the right hand and the shattering of the enemy into pieces. So as we stay, we, we know the right hand is a real place. It's a positional place where God begins to speak things that he's going to do in heaven. It's there. And as we, as we trust him at the right hand, we can, we can know that there's a, he's going to shatter the enemy into pieces. That's what it says here. In verse 7, And in the greatness of thine excellency hast thou overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest sent forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And the blast of thy nostrils, the water were gathered together, the flood stood upright as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, here's some I wills of the enemy, and not from Isaiah, but from Exodus. I will pursue I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied on them. Here's another I will. I will draw my sword, and my hand shall destroy them. And then Yahweh says, uh-uh, ain't happening. And then he says, I'm going to blow my ruach, and the sea <laughs> covers them, and, and the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. <laughs> so when the enemy thinks he's going to overtake us, and when the enemy thinks he, he's going to pursue us and divide us, and we're not even go there, we could, God says, you know what? I'm going to blow my ruach, and I'm going to take care of all of this now. I'm believing for that. When our backs are pushed against the wall, we have the ruach of the Lord that's going to be blowing on our behalf, and he's going to deal with the enemy and anything that we face that's not part of the eternal plan. I love that. <laughs> and it said they sank as lead. To the, you see a, a whew, real heavy sinking in the waters. Who is like unto thee, O Yahweh, among the Elohims? Who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. There's the right hand again. And the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy has led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold of the inhabitants of the Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab trembling shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Wow. Hey, I mean, he's taking care of enemies all over the place, right? Melting away. Um, uh, uh, amazement. Just all kinds of things. Trembling. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thy arm that they... They shall be as still as stone to thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you've made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the, ho the horse of Pharaoh went in with the chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and Yahweh brought again the waters of the sea upon them. And the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. So that's that song. The whole chapter is a dedicated song of triumph of what Elohim did in regards to the Red Sea. We've all read it. But it's going to be taking on new meaning as we move forward together as a people and as a network. And then if you keep reading here... <laughs> Oh, boy, now Miriam, boy, she gets going. It says, and Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, <laughs> took the timbrel in hand. Oh, just when you thought the, the, the singing and, the, and the, the offering was done, it's not. And all the women get forth, they get their timbrels, and they start dancing. And Miriam says, sing unto Yahweh, 
for he's triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider has he thrown into the sea. Everybody was involved in this great celebration of the delivering power of the eternal plan. And then right after that is where Moses takes the people in Exodus 15, verses 23 through 27. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Sur. And they were there three days in the wilderness. They found no water. Okay, and this is immediately right after. And they came to Marah, where they could not drink of the waters because they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Here we go all over again. How quickly people can forget the delivering power of the Lord. Did you just not walk on dry ground? Why would you even start murmuring? But it happens. And you deal with it. And it says, And he cried unto Yahweh. And in this case, this crying out led to the Lord showing the tree which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made for them a statue and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And he said unto them, If you will diligently shema the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep shamar all of his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. Now he's referring back to all the plagues, right? Yes. For I am the Lord that Rapha's you, heals thee. So at the Lord at the end of this is saying, I want commitment, I want partnership, and I want and I demand obedience. If you will do these things, I promise to you that I will not bring any of this disaster upon any of you.